time, 117th century, the Roman Empire is expanding its borders from the deserts of Africa to the oceans of Asia. The name of Victory, Rome, is being written on the shoulders of a powerful army every day. However, the area of northern Britain has not yet been conquered by the Romans. In the bloody battle that has been raging for the past 20 years, the Romans have never been able to crush the Pax, a tribe that fights using guerrilla warfare. Rome has lost thousands of soldiers. And now it's time to make a difficult decision. Either Rome will conquer northern Britain or it will bow its knees. I am a soldier of Rome. This is neither the beginning of my story nor the end. The story goes back two weeks from here. We are shown a square of Rome on the border of northern Britain. It's nighttime. Quintus Dias says, It's been two years since I've been guarding this border. There is no place in the world worse than this. Even this land is ready to kill us. The cold weather here is harsh, and it rains with the wind as if stones are falling. Even if our men survive this, the king of the Pax tribe sells his dangerous warriors who show no mercy to the Romans. My father used to say that if you want to defeat the enemy, you have to know them better than you know yourself. And I know my enemy very well. Our enemy uses force. They never engage in direct battlefield fights. They remain hidden in the darkness and strike quietly whenever they get the chance. We are taught in Rome to fight for glory. But here, the game is different. These people have no principles. They don't fight for glory. Every night, some of us become their prey. Not a single day passes without us burying our soldiers. This is a war with no end. This story is being shown to us through Quintus's perspective, which is why his narration is playing in the background. Now, a soldier comes to Quintus and tells him to rest. Quintus Dias is the second in command of his team. He goes to his tent. The soldiers are on guard, but as soon as they relax, the tribe launches an attack. Before the soldiers can react, it's too late to save themselves. They're caught off guard. In the end, as they are about to kill Quintus, he speaks to them in their language. You can all go to hell. Upon hearing this, the person who is about to kill him stops. He informs the rest of the tribe that he understands our language. Perhaps this knowledge can be useful. In this attack, only Quintus survives. The rest of the Romans are killed. Quintus is presented as a prisoner in front of the king of the tribe named Gorakon. Quintus tells us that Gorakon used to be a farmer, but when the Romans attacked, they killed his family. He became a warrior, and over time, he taught the tribe new ways to fight. This is why he has been defeating the Romans consistently. This land is their land. They know it well. They are accustomed to the weather here, which is why guerrilla warfare is saving them. There aren't enough Romans to face the tribe's army head. On, therefore, they carry out their attacks under the cover of night. Quintus is brought before the king. The king attempts to extract information from Quintus about the Roman army. Tell me, where are they planning to launch their attack from? Quintus knows that they will likely kill him regardless. Instead of begging for mercy, he responds in anger. I won't tell you anything. The tribe doesn't kill him. The king inflicts a wound on Quintus's chest in front of his younger son. Following that, Quintus is imprisoned. A few days later, he manages to escape from captivity. And when we saw him running in the beginning, he was actually fleeing from those tribes. In Rome, it is shown that the commander of the 9th Legion, Virilius, is with his soldiers. We see that he is engaged in combat with an enemy soldier. Virilius was a skilled commander and also had captured the 9th Legion. He stood out because, as a commander, he interacted with them as a friend. This approach earned him their loyalty. The next morning, a Roman governor of the Roman army arrives with a message from Gricola. Virelius is ordered to proceed to the Roman headquarters in northern Britain for assistance. He will lead 3,000 Roman soldiers there to eliminate the tribes that have obstructed their path for years. Virelius instructs his troops to prepare for war, emphasizing the importance of the upcoming battle. He queries the reason for this war. The governor responds that if they don't eliminate those tribes, the Roman army will abandon the area, leading to disgrace. The directive is clear. Find a way to eliminate them. They've been repeatedly attacking their own people. Virelius, though no fool, understands the Roman mindset. They only act in their best interests. Yet as a commander, he readies his army for the impending war. As the governor and Virelius exit the tent, a traitor stands poised to strike. However, a Pict named Aiton, hailing from the northern tribes, intervenes, killing the traitor. The governor introduces Aten, explaining that her tongue has been severed. She can't speak but can hear. She is loyal and possesses extensive knowledge about the northern tribes, including their vulnerabilities and pathways. She is to guide them. 
Virilius is skeptical of trusting one of the enemy tribes, but the governor insists. Even though slaves lack value, trust is invaluable, and he trusts is invaluable, and he trusts Aiden. Reluctantly, Virilius concedes, and Aiden leads them. Under Virilius's command, 3,000 Roman soldiers set out for the northern Roman fortresses. Meanwhile, Quintus is shown fleeing from the Below tribe. His only chance of survival lies in reaching a nearby Roman fort. But survival won't come easy. This is Bix territory, where no one escapes notice. Virilius's army approaches from one direction, while Quintus runs from the pursuing Balo tribe on the other. Guided by Aten, they spot Quintus in danger. Aten alerts Virilius, who arrives just in time to save Quintus. Virilius questions Quintus about his origins, learning he was assigned to the northern fortresses. He's the sole survivor of a Bix attack. Virilius decides to integrate Quintus into their group due to his knowledge of the area. Virilius also informs Quintus that Aiden, the girl who saved him, observed him. Quintus is perplexed about a tribe member aiding them, though he recognizes Roman intelligence. Trustworthiness might be the reason behind Aiden's action. Quintus is handed a shield. That night, Virilius's army launches an assault on the forest. During dinner, a Roman soldier mistreats Aten, yet Aten proves her self-defense prowess. The following day, as the army advances, a tree blocks their path, signaling an imminent attack. The soldiers are on high alert, but the path ahead is treacherous. There were mountains on both sides. As soon as they saw them, big balls of fire came towards them. The Romans had a great defense strategy, but these soldiers couldn't stand in front of the fire. Their balance was broken, and after the fire, the tribe attacked. The Romans were not given a chance to recover, and a bloody battle began. In a short time, the map of the war changed, leaving only the corpses of the Roman soldiers lying everywhere. During this war, when Quintus was giving orders to the soldiers, he was attacked and fell into a ditch. The corpses started to fall on him, and he fainted there. The commander Virilius was taken as a prisoner. After a while, when Quintus regained consciousness, a Roman soldier named Bottas helped him. Quintus wasn't the only one who survived in this war. There was another soldier, Breck. When the three of them saw the corpses of people around, they felt very bad. In the meantime, they found three more soldiers alive. Tex, Leonidas, and Marcos. Only six of these soldiers survived out of 3,000. They were talking when a pig was going to kill them, but a sword flew and hit its head. This was the seventh person who survived this attack, and his name was Tere. Now, some soldiers said that they had to go back home, but Quintus said no. They had to find Virilius's corpse. He had died in a hurry, and they had to take the corpse back to Rome. Tex said that Virilius wasn't dead. He saw that those people took him alive with them. Quintus said that he knew where they took him, and they had to bring him back. It was their responsibility. Some soldiers, even though they wanted to, supported Quintus in this quest. The pigs hadn't gone far, so these people followed them. While hiding from them on the way, everyone found out Tex was, in fact, a traitor. She deliberately led Virelius' army here so that these people could easily kill them. Quintus and his companions couldn't attack suddenly, so they decided to go to their village. If Aurelius was there, they would free him. As night fell, they set up in a cave. Quintus tried to find out where they were from and how they joined the army, and he guarded the night. Aurelius was brought before the king. When Aurelius saw Tex, he called her a traitor. The king told him that Tex was a girl, and when the Romans attacked her, they killed her family in front of her, abused her, and cut her tongue at the end so she couldn't tell anyone about the Roman. Then she came to him, and he taught her the best martial arts. She knew only one thing, to shed Roman blood. It was the only purpose of her life. Then the king's son stabbed Virilius in the chest. These people didn't kill Virilius. Now, Quintus and his companions reached the village to save Virilius in the middle of the night. They secretly entered the village and killed the guards. As they were about to free Virilius, Virilius asked if the legions had arrived. Quintus replied that not only were they left, but they had also come to free him. They were trying to break the chains with which Virilius was tied. But in the meantime, a group was coming towards the village. They had very little time and could not free Virilius. You go, save your life, he urged, telling Quintus that it was now his responsibility to take the people back home. The rest of the soldiers were guarding the area. When Tex saw the people of the tribe coming, he hid in the house. The king's son was also there. But when he made noise, Tex killed him. They left Virilius there and ran away. Upon discovering that some Romans had come to save Virilius and killed his son, the king was filled with sorrow. 
In the morning, he burned his son's body, telling Virilius, See what you've done. Then he freed him and placed a sword in his hand. His confrontation was with Etain. Etain was fast, and she killed Virilius. The king ordered her to find the others, separate their heads, and bring them back. Skilled in tracking, Etain set out after Quintus and his companions. Meanwhile, they were fleeing the opposite direction. We will not go south, Quintus declared. They must be thinking that we are running towards Rome. But we will go north, which they would not have even thought. This will make the road very long, but we will reach a safe place, since Quintus was familiar with the area. Everyone supported him. They knew that death was inevitable in either case, and they had to keep moving. If they stopped, they would be killed by Etain, the relentless hunter. The next morning was spent running. They hunted a deer but had no time to cook it, settling instead for drinking its blood and taking some meat. Quintus's plan was working as Etain thought they were going south, but when she found a deer's corpse on the way, she understood their plan. While running, Tarek fell and broke his leg. He screamed in pain, and although the others tried to calm him, Etain heard them. An arrow flew straight towards Quintus, and he ordered everyone to run. They picked up Tariq and started to climb a hill, knowing that the horses couldn't follow. But when they reached the top, they saw a river below and Etain and his companions closing in from behind. Jump! Quintus ordered, and one by one they leaped into the water. Tarek was killed by arrows from Etain's companions. After jumping, Marcos and Tex got separated from the group, and for a while, they were out of Etain's sight. They escaped from the water where wolves had spotted them and ran for their lives. Quintus, Breck, Leonidas, and Botos were saved, but not for long. Now injured, Leonidas couldn't walk, so Quintus and Breck kept watch on the enemy's movements along the river. But Etain was suspicious, and they knew they couldn't rest easy. The chase was far from over. She stops somewhere, and Breck is very surprised. How is she doing all this, he wonders. Quintus tells him that there is no magic in it. She is a tracker, and she realizes this. At night, Quintus decides that by taking advantage of the darkness, they will attack the enemy team. Otherwise, the enemies will never leave them be. They leave Botos with Leonidas, and Breck and Quintus secretly attack the enemy camp. But Etain doesn't give up. Just as Quintus had thought, Etain had also attacked their camp. She killed Leonidas and injured Botos, but didn't kill him. Instead, she tells her companions to let his blood flow. When Quintus and Breck come back, they save Breck, but now they will have a hard time running. Etain had played her trick. She could have killed them if she wanted, but now they will be weakened by Botos and they will be hunted. Quintus, having been there for a long time, was understanding her tricks. If anyone was saving them, it was Quintus. Tonight, when Quintus and Breck went to attack the enemy's camp, Quintus found out that the king had sent these people after him because one of them had killed his son. Now, Quintus was the only one who knew about this because he was the only one who knew the language. On the other side, Marcos and Tex are shown. They're running from wolves but get tired while running. Marcos falls, so he asks for help from Tex. Tex, being a selfish man, injures Marcos so that the wolves will take him away and stop chasing Tex. He commits suicide, and Marcos also dies. The next morning, Quintus and Breck take Bodos and move on. After walking for a while, they find a house by the river. Tired, hungry, and in need of treatment, Quintus says that they will ask for help. They go to the house, finding no one there at the time. They lay Bodos down. As soon as Quintus comes out, the owner of the house, a girl, arrives. She is scared to see them, but Quintus calms her down. He takes out his sword, trying to give it to her. We are not here to hurt you. We, you are not here to hurt you. When the girl, whose name is Ariana, believes that they are travelers, she helps them. She treats Bodo's leg and gives them food. Quintus trusts this girl, but Bodo's and Breck do not. Ariana tells her story, explaining that she has been expelled from the tribe. They consider her a magician who has cursed everyone, believing that the Romans have come because of her, taking their land. Ariana is the only one left and is not very attached to her people. Quintus and his friends spend the night there. The next morning, Quintus realizes that Etain has come in search of them. Ariana hides them in the house, lying to Etain. Etain becomes suspicious, but Ariana is clever. She provokes Etain, who was about to kill her, but a member of Eden's group forbids him, fearing that it may bring a curse upon them. So, leaving him there, Etain and his friends move forward, while Quintus and his friends are left alone. Now they cannot stay here anymore, so they have to go. They thank Ariana, who tells them about a Roman guard nearby, which is not far. If they reach there, they may be saved. Quintus takes his friends and leaves, but
But after this meeting, he falls in love with Ariana. Before leaving, he leaves a gift for her. After a day's patience, they reach the Roman guard, thrilled that they're saved. But as soon as they go inside, they find the place completely empty. There's an order. Dracula has removed the army from here, and new guards are positioned towards the south. They feel crushed after hearing this. Brig laments. There was no point in our fighting. We came here for no reason. So many witnesses, so many difficult jails. Soon after, Etain and his friends reach there. But now Quintus declares that he's tired of running. So the three decide to fight. They take all the weapons they find, and as Etain and his people move to attack, Quintus and his friends begin fighting for their safety. A great battle ensues in which Brig is killed, but all three fight bravely. Etain is killed by Quintus, and only Botos and only Botos and Quintus are left. There's no one to follow them. At night, they set up camp, and a soldier arrives. When Quintus asks about Marcos, the soldier says he died because of wolves. Quintus knows it happened because of Dex, as he killed the king's son. The next day, they reach a Roman square, but their clothes don't resemble those of Romans. Botos is killed, and Dex wants to kill Quintus as well. Dex warns Quintus not to tell the governor about his deeds, but Quintus defiantly replies that he will tell the truth. They start fighting, and Quintus kills Dex. Later, when the Romans find out Quintus is one of them, they take him inside to the governor. Quintus recounts the story, saying that Sykes killed everyone and he's the only survivor. He reveals his true identity. The governor's wife warns her husband that returning to Rome like this would be shameful. They decide to kill Quintus secretly. When the governor's wife and the guards try to kill him, Quintus fights back and kills the guards. He spares the governor's wife but accuses her of hiding the truth. She says he's in danger, but he insists on returning north. He reaches Ariana, injured, and tells her that she must save him again. They agree to live together. In the end, Quintus's voice is heard. My name is Quintus Dias. I'm a fugitive of Rome. This is not the beginning of my story, and neither is it the end. And that concludes the movie. Friends, I hope you liked our explanation. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. If you liked the video, don't forget to hit the like button.